All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going, team? Here, and this is BXJS Weekly, episode seventy, bringing you all the best JavaScript news of the week in a podcast form. I was really surprised by the number seventy there, even though I just wrote it a few minutes ago. But um, yeah, that is that is quite a quite a long time since we started doing this, but. Nonetheless, let's just jump right into the podcast and see what we got today. There is not that many things. There's quite a bit of libraries and demos, but we don't really actually have that many articles and uh, we don't have quite a bit of releases that are pretty big. So let's get started with the getting started section. Um, as usual, all the best tutorials I could find over the week. The first one we got here is a simple thing I learned during a code review, text templates. It's a pretty nice introduction to tagged templates that work kind of like function, but on the templates, as you might imagine. And if you never seen syntax like this, or you never heard about tagged templates, I would highly recommend looking through the article because it is a very neat thing. And uh, it just helps to know about it. So there you go. Next article we got here is how to publish a progressive web app on the Google Play Store. And this is a pretty nice tutorial that essentially walks you step by step on taking your PVA and uh, or I guess PWA and um, publishing it to Google Store. So if you ever looked for, you know, on how to do that, we already talked about that a bit, I think, but there was never a proper like step by step tutorial. So this is essentially everything you ever will need to know, including all the packaging, the registration, the fees and stuff like this. So if you are building progressive web app, and you want to publish it on Google Play Store, there is your guide. Um, next thing we got here is implementing least recently used cache in JavaScript. So yeah, it's very straightforward. If you ever were curious, I guess how LRU works, or maybe wanted to implement your own, but didn't exactly know how, then this tutorial got you covered. It's, you know, not a very lengthy one, but it does explain how LRUs work and how do you build one yourself in JavaScript. So there you go. Next article we got here is RxJS switch map, concat map, merge map, and exhaust map. Four operators that are arguably most complex ones in RxJS. I think it took me the longest time to actually figure out how you know what, how they work and what is the difference between them. So if you are working with RxJS and getting started with those operators and still don't quite get what they are and what they do and how, when do you use them most importantly, this article is for you. Not only does it explain what they do, it also shows visually what exactly happens when you create uh, use the specific operator on different streams, um, or different observables, I guess. So yes, do check it out. It is actually quite good. I think no, that's not it. We have two more articles. So one more is exploring sapper and swelts a quick tutorial, a pretty nice introduction to sapper and swelt. So I did something similar on the live stream when we built the RSS reader. Um, if you prefer text, then there you go. This is a very nice um, basic tutorial that shows you how to use Sapper and Swelt to set up a very basic project and render a few pages, including server side rendering and all that kind of stuff. So if you're curious about Sapper and Swelt, make sure to check this one out. The next thing we got here is parsing expressions in JS. So uh, by expressions in this case means mathematical expressions as in the simple plus minus division and multiplication. So it's very straightforward. I remember having a task like this in university and I remember that it brought me a tons of headaches. So now I understand it is actually really straightforward, but at the time it was incredibly painful. This article does a decent job of explaining how exactly do you write a parser and lexer and all that kind of stuff. So if you are you know, if you encounter similar tasks, or maybe you wanted to delve into parsing yourself, make sure to check this one out. There is quite a lot of very interesting um, explanations here. Let's just put it this way. All right, I think that is actually it for getting started section. Now we are coming to the articles and news. We only have two articles here today. The first one is from the V8 Tim. Uh, it's called Mscripton and the LLVM uh, WebAssembly Backend. So this is talking about the LLVM WebAssembly backend that is going to be default starting the next version, I believe, of, of Mscripton. And um, essentially, the article looks at the improvements LLVM WebAssembly backend brings to the Mscripton code compilation to WebAssembly and so on and so forth. The uh, highlights are much faster linking, faster and smaller codes, support for all LLVM IRs. Uh, this is something I did not know. So the fast comp, the previous 
uh, backend did not, it only could handle uh, LLVM IR emitted by CLang, which is, um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's just like one of the IR intermediate representations and there's like LLVM is a huge in, in ecosystem, right? So that was like, you had to specifically add support for others, which was a pain in ass. And the LLVM WebAssembly backend, because it's just LLVM backend, supports everything, which is kind of awesome. So that means that uh, Mscript essentially will become a bit more ubiquitous, I guess, maybe? I'm, I'm not exactly sure. Um, yeah, but I mean, we'll see. It's, it's an interesting implication anyway. It also allows to add uh, new WebAssembly features, such as simmed tail calls, exceptions, and so on and so forth, and uh, faster general uh, updates from upstream. So it will be easier to update the mscript itself, which is quite nice. There is, as usual, quite a lot of benchmarks uh, and comparisons for the code size, for the speed, and for the build times especially. So it's, it's interesting to see that the build time uh, itself, the compilation is actually increased a bit, but the linking is so much faster that you overall has like oven s over seven times faster compile time, <laughs> which is uh, kind of insane when you think about it. Adding on top of that, the smaller bundles and stuff like this, this is uh, pretty impressive. So if you have any interest in WebAssembly, make sure to check this one out. There is quite a lot of interesting information and uh, yeah, it seems to be going uh, quite nicely. So the next thing we got here is supercharge your swell state management with Akita. The tutorial for using Akita state management library, which I believe we had a look at um, half a year ago, if not more. Um, it was initially announced for React, if I remember correctly, and uh, now they showcase how to use it with uh, swell. I'm not actually sure if that's their official blog or not, but uh, the article is actually very in depth and uh, it looks like it works quite well together. So if you are using Svelte and we're looking for a different state management solution than what the Svelte itself offers, then maybe have a look at this. Maybe this is exactly what you were looking for. It is actually quite good. Okay, that is um, sadly it for the articles and news. There wasn't that many big ones this week around. So now we're coming to the tips, tricks and bit-sized awesomeness. The first thing being the article on uh, Dev2 that is called HTML can do that. And it's a nice collection of HTML elements that you probably never heard of and uh, never seen. Stuff like uh, the Dropbox where you can actually type and it will actually auto suggest you things. And yes, this is plain HTML. There's the dialog boxes, progress meters, expand collapse for details, and a bunch of other things that, I mean, I didn't know some of them. So like some of them are relatively obscure, but you know, you encounter them sooner or later, but others are so obscure that I've never even heard about them. <laughs> so if you're curious to check it out, it's actually quite good. The next article we got here is Brave improves its ad blocker performance by 69 times with a new em engine implementation in Rust. So uh, Brave is Chromium based browser, right? So they took the Chromium, they adapted it, and now it's called Brave and it has some bunch of changes under the hood. One of the core features of Brave is integrated ad blocking. And uh, prior to this, I believe they just basically integrated the Adblock Plus, if I remember correctly. And it wasn't anything special. So it was literally just Adblock Plus integrated into the core of the browser. Um, and now they've actually looking at the Chromium uh, manifest with three changes and everything. They decided they need a better engine themselves, right? So they no longer wanted to rely on something third party. And um, they took what they have and rewritten it using Rust. So if you're curious, there is actually a repository. So I before that, I kind of assumed Brave was closed source, but it turns out everything is open source. So they have the Adblock Rust engine prototype repository where you can just have a look at it and explore it and compile it yourself if you so desire. It is actually really cool. And um, the article itself goes into more in depth uh, to, to show what exactly are the problems there and why did they need the algorithm, the new algorithm, why did they decide to write it in Rust um, and how do they actually evaluate the performance of it. The performance changes are insane. So there's like, as it said, 69 times. Yeah, 69 times. Um, obviously, you know, comparing Rust to JavaScript, uh, this is about what you would get when you do pattern matching, but the pattern matching itself is a pretty tricky area. So uh, nonetheless, it is a very neat 
thing to see. And uh, if you have even slight interest in ad blocking, I would recommend checking this out and maybe even looking at the pattern matching source code, which is uh, quite interesting. Next thing we got here is the new issue under the flare rework for react, um, which is uh, f focused on rethinking focus. <laughs> That's a terrible way of putting it. But uh, there we go. So yeah, the idea is that focus uh, is a mess on DOM. So the idea is not to use DOM and actually use the react specific components that would allow you to manage the focus on the HTML elements in a more fine grained way. The cool thing is that it's all aimed to be completely accessible. And obviously, you know, the Facebook team has an incredible test platform in form of Facebook that is used by billions of users, like literally billions. So they can test it and see how it works out. The RFC itself actually looks really cool. I um, So I guess, you know, the API itself is very low level. So you probably would not use something like this yourself, but rather bake it into the components library which could be incredibly helpful because yeah, some of those things are really, really cool. So if you have any interest in uh, focus management in React, make sure to check this one out. Next thing we got here is announcing stable releases of Gatsby themes. Uh, so yes, Gatsby themes are a thing. And before that, they were under experimental themes flag in uh, Gatsby config. But no longer the flag is now removed and you can just use them as is. And uh, yeah, it seems like they're pretty straightforward. Now, I already said said that in our Discord chat before, but I've actually got tasked with exploring the options for statically generating a website for our research group. And uh, next week, I'm going to be streaming Gatsby because of that. So we're just going to do a deep dive into Gatsby and see how it works and try to figure out if it's a good fit for us or not. So if you're curious, do um, subscribe and track the uh, Twitch because it's probably going to happen on Tuesday or Wednesday. We're going to get a look at the Gatsby, but nonetheless, uh, now we can use these themes out of the box, which sounds quite convenient. Um, next thing we got here is the announcement from Wasmer, which um, allows you now allows you to run Python interpreter that is compiled to WebAssembly using Pyodite. Um, yeah, so you can use Web, you can install WebAssembly, and then you can install Python and run Python from WebAssembly because I like I I don't know why, but now you can. <laughs> So this is kind of the thing. I mean, I guess it's really cool for the browser and uh, for like teaching environments. But other than that, I don't know if I see any value in this, but uh, nonetheless, it's a really cool demo. Next thing we got here is the announcement from uh, Chrome team. So they've actually implemented the new Async Clipboard API version and that will ship in the next version of Chrome and it will enable uh, apps to put the images into the clipboard, which is something that was not possible before. For now, it's just going to be only PNG images, but you know, they're going to extend it over the time, uh, which is actually incredibly helpful. It was always a pain in the ass that you couldn't properly copy and I mean, you know, it's kind of pain in the ass in general, uh, working with clipboard from JavaScript, but uh, the fact that you could only work with text is even more annoying. So uh, maybe we're going there to a better clipboard API in the next couple of years. Okay, continuing, we got a SNCC article uh, from the SNCC research team. They discovered a prototype pollution security vulnerability in Lawdash. Now, normally you don't really have to worry about that. So the idea is that there is the default deep uh, methods that allows you to deep merge objects. And the problem is that you can fit it a specific payload that will make it um, modify object.prototype instead of the actual object you pass to it, which is, I mean, which can be abused, right? But the only way at least I could come up of the abuse of this kind of thing is when you allow user to generate the payload. So it can be like, you know, the cross site scripting or something along those lines where you hijack someone else's browser essentially by giving them malicious snippet. But if you don't do that, I'm not even sure if that's like a that big of a vulnerability. Like if, if it's your code, then you probably don't care. But nonetheless, uh, the fix by them, uh, which is quite cool actually, has already been merged into Lodash Master and the release should come out quite uh, soon. So there you go. Okay, um, that is actually it for the tips, tricks and bit-sized awesomeness. Now we're coming to the releases section. The first major release of the week is the June release uh, version 1.36 of VS Code. 
Um, there's a bunch of minor things pretty much here. I think the highlight for me is the uh, tree intent guidelines. So we can finally have guidelines, uh, intent guidelines in the tree manager. That was a bit annoying from time to time, especially when you went into the deeply nested folders. So now it looks just a tiny bit better. And there's also a bunch of other things. So if you're curious, do check it out. Uh, next thing we got here is React Native version 0.60. A pretty big release with a focus on accessibility, a better a Hello World page that we now see, Android X support, which is a really cool and uh, essentially, yeah, it's it's like it's not even out yet if I remember correctly, and they're already supporting it. So they have the Google has the beta now, right? So you can uh, opt in if you are on the Pixel phone, but that's about it. It's really cool that they already support it. Um, the Cocoa Pods are now enabled and uh, I guess integrated by default, so you no longer have to manually add them and install them if you're working on iOS projects. Uh, it always was a huge pain in ass to do that. Now it's just uh, there basically. And there's a bunch of other lean core removals. So if you're working with React Native already and planning to upgrade, make sure to check this out because WebView and Net NetInfo were instructed before and now the geolocation has been removed completely. So it's a third party package. If you need geolocation in your app, you will have to install it yourself. Uh, oh yeah, another cool feature is that the native modules you install will now be auto-linked. No more running React Native Link. So that's kind of great. Um, yeah, that's basically all the highlights. If you're curious about more information, do check out the release notes. There is quite a lot of uh, additional descriptions there. And uh, yes, hi Donna, welcome to the stream. How's it going? Uh, but yeah, it's it's a pretty big release and I'm actually curious when the React Native will become version 1.0. Uh, hey, Frontend Nexus, welcome to the stream. All right, uh, going next, we got the release of Overmind from Cerebral, uh, which is version 90 and 20 and 2 and 4. Uh, this versioning a bit confuses me, but um, I guess let's just call it Overmind version 19 for the sake of it. Uh, we have some people in the Discord chat that actually use it and were happy with it. I personally, I remember reading about it at the time of the first release, which was like a version one couple of years ago. But uh, yeah, it seems to have gone quite a few versions since then. Um, if you are using it, check it out. If you never heard of it, I guess check it out as well. It's a state management library and some people are quite happy with it. And yes, it's now version 19. So sounds like a good time to check it out. Uh, hey, Donna, thank you for your donation. Thank you for your support as always. Okay, continuing, we got NPM version 6.10 release. The There's like minor things, but the highlight for me here specifically was the production flag for NPM audit. So you can now run NPM audit minus minus production to get the audition only for the production dependencies. So you won't get... You know, those annoying bugs or uh, annoying reports for the stuff that is, you know, kind of vulnerable in your dev dependencies, which is about 90% of time you just don't care, right? Uh, so this is very handy, very nice to have. And uh, now you can have it in your NPM with just installing the latest one. Right, next release we got here is Babel version 7.5 uh, that adds dynamic import and F sharp pipelines, the version of the pipelines that I, perf um, I personally like the most. So there's the uh, two proposals, I guess two concurrent proposals, the smart pipelines, which was the previous one that Babel had implemented and F sharp style pipelines. There's something the new and I believe at least it looks from you know all the discussions this is what we're going to be getting and I personally like it a lot more than the smart pipeline syntax. The idea is that you basically define uh, function expressions right in line to do multi-argument things which you know in my opinion this is way more readable than this hash thing that is a bit confusing. This looks like JavaScript. This looks like something else basically. <laughs> Considering we use the hash for the private properties, that's even more confusing, I would say. But uh, yeah, so you can now try out F sharp pipelines with Babel if you want to. And there's now the dynamic import support. So you can just yeah, enable it and use it. Uh, there is experimental TypeScript namespaces support and a bunch of other things. So if you're using Babel, make sure to update and uh, maybe check out the notes. Maybe this is useful for you. Right, next release we got here is Node.js version 12.6. Um, the, yeah, the, they put back the experiment, blah, let me try that again. They put back the experimental MIPS architecture. I 
honestly not even sure where it, where it is used, but maybe you use it, then uh, good news, you can try experimental Node.js MIPS builds, which is quite nice. The uh, personal um, best highlight for me was the addition of process resource usage, which allows you to get the current usage of the CPU time for the current process. So it's no longer just, you know, overall system stats, but you can actually get the process resource usage, which is can be quite damn useful. So there you go. If you are doing a lot of benchmarking, a lot of fine tuning, this release could be very useful for you. Okay, um, that is it for the releases. Now we're coming to the libraries and demos. We do have quite a bit of them. The first one here is FarmHash, a Node.js implementation of FarmHash, Google's family of high performance hash functions. So if you ever wanted to use high performance hash functions uh, in JavaScript and, or I guess in Node.js because it actually uses the C version of those functions and wraps them with JavaScript essentially, if you really needed really, really fast hashing functions, then there you go. Now you can use the ones from Google, which uh, I guess is probably among the fastest ones. And now you can just use them with JavaScript, which is quite nice. The next thing we got here is Bounce.js. Asynchronous boundary detection, lazy loading, infinite scrolling, and more. So it's essentially a nice wrapper around intersection observer. So the caveat supply, you know, intersection observer is not supported anywhere. So Internet Explorer won't work. And then the browsers have to be relatively new-ish. Uh, but yes, I mean, intersection observer doesn't really have a super complex API on its own, but the boundary J bounce JS actually make it a lot easier to work with it. Um, so if you're we're looking at intersection observer and thought this is a bit too complex. Maybe have a look at bounce JS. Maybe this is uh, simplifies it enough for you. Next thing we got here is nope validator, a small, simple and fast JS validator. Like, like, wow, that's fast. I absolutely love statements like this. Um, I hope they, they do have, they do have benchmarks. Okay. But uh, nonetheless, it's a validator that allows you to validate uh, JavaScript objects and shapes uh, by defining the shape through the function call formats, uh, very similar to like Joy and stuff like this. So if you weren't happy with Joy for some reason, or maybe you were looking for something like this, do check it out. It seems to have quite a lot of features. And uh, yeah, they also claim to be very fast. They compare themselves to Yup only for some reason. I'm not sure why there's no stuff like Joy and stuff, but um, there you go. So if you're looking for validation and wanted it to be really fast, then maybe this is what you want. Next thing we got here is Program Cli. This is a self-hosted Instagram style gallery for all your photos. A progressive web app that is kind of like Instagram allows you to crop photos and apply very basic filters. Um, yeah, you can self host it in one command. It looks quite nice. I guess as a learning material, it might be quite good. I believe it doesn't actually have any testing and testing frameworks, which is certainly a downside, but uh, you know, other than that, uh, maybe have a look at the source code, maybe you'll learn something. Next thing we got here is log with status bar, a line weight logger with a status bar on the bottom that does not disappear with scrolling essentially allows you to uh, do logs, long logs with a status bar that shows something else, uh, which can be quite convenient in some cases. So if you're looking at something like this, do check it out. Next thing we got here is simple D3 heat map, a JavaScript module to create heat map calendars. If you ever wanted to do a GitLab like, uh, sorry, GitHub like thing with your calendar, and render it uh, using D3.js. Now you can, this, this simplifies it quite a bit. And uh, there was a demo somewhere, there we go. And uh, yeah, you can, you can do it in just a few lines of code essentially, which is quite handy. And it also supports different views and basically you can do whatever the hell you want, right? So it's very straightforward. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Next thing we got here is a light DOM, a reactive web component library to create custom elements and turn any HTML sections into components, which is a pretty interesting premise, but as you might know, or maybe not, I am not a huge fan of web, uh, let me try that again. Not a huge fan of web components. I find them to be too limiting in comparison to stuff like React or Vue. So uh, yeah, but maybe you are a lot into web components and you wanted a better library than all the other existing ones. So check it out. Maybe this is what you want. Next thing we got here is use position, a react hook for fetching and following a browser geolocation. That is uh, incredibly easy to use. I will not allow my position to it because I want to 
share my coordinates with all the stream, but uh, nonetheless, it works. It asks you for a position automatically. It basically handles all the user interactions for you and just gives you back latitude, longitude, timestamp, accuracy, and error if there is any. So if you're working with something that requires positioning in React, it seems like a pretty nice solution. Next thing we got here is Jimp, an image processing library written entirely in JavaScript for Node.js with zero external or native dependencies, which is uh, pretty damn impressive. Uh, it actually supports quite a lot of things, like it, it can blit images, it can blur stuff, it can co do color manipulations, check if image is contained within a hate and width, cover, flip, Gaussian, blur, and so on and so forth. So if you were looking for a processing image processing library and for some reason, uh, what was it? Sharp, I think, right? Uh, wait a second, sharp, but no, not harp, sharp note. There we go. I already searched for it. Yes. In for some reason, sharp JS uh, didn't really cut it for you, maybe because of its native dependencies that were not available for your platform. Seems like Jimp is the way to go. Obviously, it's a lot simpler because, uh, you know, there's like, way less filters and processing, but it actually seems pretty impressive for the pure JavaScript library. All right, continuing, we got GoWebGC. Um, so it's a Go compiler that is built into WebAssembly and wrapped to run in directly in the browser. So you can actually open the playground and uh, hit run and this will compile and run the Go program directly in your browser and show you the output, which is Insane, but yes, it works. And I, I mean, you know, Golang has the architecture, target architecture of WebAssembly by default. So Golang is written in Golang. So you can just, you know, take and build it, I'm assuming. I'm not sure if there's actually any additional steps were involved, but I guess it was that straightforward. <laughs> but nonetheless, a pretty nice experiment. So if you're interested, do check it out. Uh, next thing we got here is Memory.js. This is actually a really old, um, library that I have not encountered before, but it allows you to read and write process memory in Node.js. So yes, you can actually use Node.js and Electron, for example, to manipulate other process memory. And uh, for example, you can use it for hacking games, right? This is the most straightforward. I think this is one of the pr process memory editing that almost everyone who plays video games did at one point using programs like Art Money or whatever. And now you can do it with Node.js, which, you know, seems pretty straightforward. And uh, obviously the lib itself is 90% C and then the rest is JavaScript, uh, but it is quite cool. So if you ever needed to edit other processes memory and or maybe wanted to try and do that, then there you go. You can now do it with Node.js. Next thing we got here is 11T, a simple, simpler static site generator. Uh, this was shared in our Discord server just yesterday, I think, and it looks actually pretty damn nice. So it's supposed to be a very, very simple static website generator that supports for, well, just about everything, starting from Markdown and going to EJS, Mustache, Pug, whatever the hell you want, basically. Looks pretty nice. Um, so if you are looking for a very, very simple static website generator and I don't know, Gatsby maybe was too complex for you, do check this one out. This seems to be quite nifty. Next thing we got here is Frappe Charts, uh, a very simple, modern, intuitive, responsive charts with zero dependencies. That, um, yeah, look really cool actually. So the demos they have are very, very nice and the source code for them is super straightforward. So if you wanted to work with a chart but were terrified of D3JS or wanted to have something lightweight with zero dependencies and uh, by the way, MIT licensed, have to know that, then do check this one out. It seems to be very cool. Also SVG charts, so they are extremely uh, efficient and tiny. Next thing we got here is zip, a robust zip decoder with defenses against dangerous compression radius, spec deviation, malicious archive signatures, and a bunch of other vulnerabilities basically that zip has. Um, yeah, there is like a whole list here of what it prevents. So if you're working with a user uploaded zips and you want to be very, very sure that your app does not blow up because of a zip bump or something like this, 
then you can use this module to basically unpack it and it will just fail if there is any of those malicious things in there so uh yeah there you go next thing we got here is use custom elements a custom react hook to bridge custom elements to react uh, so yes you can now just use this hook and include any custom uh html web element or html custom element i guess into the react app which um, actually seems to be super damn straightforward so um yeah if you ever needed to do that check this one out Next thing we got here is multi-stream, a stream that emits multiple other streams one after another. So um, not sure what the use cases would be, but uh, yeah, you can do that and it seems to work relatively straightforward. So you just pass it an array and then it will pipe stuff from one stream after another. I, yeah, I, like I, don't, I, I always, I typically use um, Highland if I need to work with streams and I guess I would just use Highland Concat instead of that, but uh, Maybe you have a simpler use case or maybe you have a different thing in mind. So uh, do check it out. It seems like it could be helpful in quite a few cases. Next thing we got here is React Movable, a drag and drop for your React lists and tables, accessible and tiny. Has just a four kilobytes min zipped size and allows you to do drag and drop uh, in lists and tables, as it said. Super easy to set up, accessibility, keyboard support and all of that stuff. In some, if for some reason React Beautiful D&D is not working out for you, do check this one out. This seems to be a pretty nice alternative. Next thing we got here is Reef M, a React input format and mask, a tiny 800 bytes component for transform any input into formatted or masked inputs. Supports number date, phone, currency, credit card, and so on. Um, so the gist of it is that basically it can allow you to Take any input uh, and uh, what is happening with my code sandbox? Come on, Can you please load not. What do you mean not found? I just loaded five minutes ago when I tested this. Ugh, come on. Code sandbox, please. What is happening? Uh, but <laughs> okay, I guess it doesn't want to work for some reason. But anyway, the thing is that you can basically define format or mask on top of any nested input and it will automatically apply sanitize filter it and so on and so forth, which uh, seems pretty nice. So the examples they had were working quite nicely just before the stream, but of course it's gonna break when I'm showing it off. Right, um, the next thing we got here is REST hooks, a delightful data fetching for React. A pretty nice collection of um, hooks that you can use to fetch data into the React, uh, which seems to be very handy. So for some reason you wanted to do that uh, yeah, it seems like it also supports, uh, no, su su supports, no, that's not a word, supports React Suspense. So that might be quite neat. Um, so yes, it seems like a very nice thing. It has a TypeScript support and everything. So maybe check this out if you're fetching a lot of data in React and uh, wanted to do this in a better way, basically. Next thing we got here is Bob, binary data streams plus via producers, data consumers, and pool flow. So this is a part of a new strategic initiatives within Node.js, uh, aiming to improve Node.js streaming data interfaces uh, within Node.js currently and hopefully also future public APIs. So this is essentially a full internal rework of how these streams work within the Node.js, which is supposed to make them nicer to work with and a lot faster. Um, there is, like it's already implemented, this is a prototype essentially, you can try it out if you want to. It is absolutely fascinating how complex the damn streams are. <laughs> but um, yeah, if you're working a lot with streams and you are interested in what's actually happening in Node.js core, do check this one out. There is some very interesting stuff. Okay, and the last thing we got here today in the demo section is the Odin project that I honestly haven't seen before, but they actually added a new curriculum recently. So they it's, it's a free web development full stack curriculum supported by open source community. And they recently added Node.js. So you could do, before that you could do like front end, Ruby, databases, Rails, and JavaScript. And then there's, I think that's the separate getting hired thing. And now they have Node.js as well. So if you are just getting started with software development, or maybe you wanted to learn like Ruby programming or whatnot, um, this 
is according to people on the internet this is a really good uh, project for uh, junior God, why is it so hard to speak for junior developers is what i want to say but again okay, there we go okay that is it for the libraries and demos we got some interesting and silly stuff so first thing I want to highlight today is this uh, scientific paper called Code Coverage and Post-Release Defects, a large-scale study on open source projects. Now, this is um, essentially a statistical analysis of a bunch of different um, post-release defects, as it calls it, right? Bugs, essentially, after the release and correlation of these bugs with code coverage that the project has. So, you know, like how important is it to have 100% code coverage? Study itself is pretty big. Um, there is a ton of data, but I'm just gonna read you the conclu like one of the conclusions. Um, the findings of our study are, at the project level, code coverage has an insignificant correlation to the number of bugs, as well as to the other metrics, such as number of bugs per line of code and number of bugs per complexity found after the release of the software. So um, yeah, code coverage, <laughs> code coverage does not correlate with you know, it doesn't basically help you fix bugs um, because you will ha like it's 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 very interesting because you would expect you know having the perfect code coverage would decrease the number of bugs, right? Because it makes sense. Like you covered all of your code, it's hundred percent. This is at least the typical uh, thought flow that I've seen in people who tend to push for the hundred percent code coverage. But it turns out, and this study basically proves it that majority of bugs do not come from the specific lines, but they actually come from the logical, so the, the dominant bugs, they are the logical fallacies. So you thought it works in this way, but it actually happened in other way, and it has nothing to do with your code coverage, essentially. And uh, yeah, there is a ton of statistics here. There's a ton more insights. So if you are curious, make sure to read it. It is not a very easy read because it is a scientific paper. But uh, yeah, it's quite, quite fascinating. Okay, next thing we got here is the missing checkbox uh, or the missing part, I guess, uh, Swift Web UI. So Apple took React Paradigm and made Swift UI out of it. Someone took Swift UI and made Swift Web UI, which is basically React, but in Swift for web, which actually looks quite nice. So I wish we had syntax like this working with React as well, because this essentially you could write this in JSX and it would do exactly the same thing. But uh, yeah, this is just, I wish we had the alternative syntax to JSX that would look like this. But I guess for that we would need this uh, do syntax that we looked last time. Uh, in the last podcast we had that proposal that is stage zero that would allow for this basically. But uh, Nonetheless, if you're curious about Swift UI and you are curious how to use it on the web, do check this one out. And the next thing I wanna highlight here is Zacademics. Um, the Zactronics made all of their games free for schools and nonprofit school-like organizations. So if you are teaching somewhere, especially kids, and you want to teach them programming, then just uh, shoot them an email. Zactronics games are freaking amazing and I struggle uh, with some of them even at my level, especially, you know, like Shenzhen IO or Exapunks. Man, this could be a hell of a program, but they are extremely fun and they are very, very cool. So if you are teaching somewhere and you wanted to teach your kids programming without um, too much problems, then yeah, you can even teach them how to build a factory. There's right, there's an Infinity factory as well. I forgot about that one. Yes, it's a really cool initiative, I think. And uh, the last thing we got here today is user in your face, uh, the most infuriating user interface that you will ever try. And uh, yes, it's a game that um, challenges you to fill the form as, as fast and as accurate as possible. And to even start it, you will have to figure out how to actually, where to click to continue to the next page. I won't show you, so you just have to figure it out yourself. It is absolutely infuriating, but uh, also really fun to see how many dark patterns that we basically see every day are, are, are now just considered normal. It is, yeah, it is a bit sad. <laughs> but okay, that is actually it from my side. So this was quite short today. This was BXJS episode 70. As usual, you can find all the links on GitHub or on bxjs.dev website. 
you are free to join our Discord server to discuss JavaScript or video games if you want to. And uh, yeah, that's basically it from my side. If you guys have any questions or suggestions or maybe links that I missed this week, do feel free to throw them into the chat right now. Um, if not, we can wrap it up and go do something more fun. Um, thank you for your Twitch Prime subscription from the Nexus. Uh, highly appreciate it. Uh, that is really awesome. Um, yeah, I... That's basically it. One of the. <laughs> I also forgot how to speak. Basically, uh, right. So, um, yeah, that's basically all I have. I don't know why I'm. I'm just spacing out right now. It is. It is getting warm here again. I don't want to be warm. I want to be like nice, twenty-five degrees or something. But uh, yeah, I guess summer has different uh, different idea about that. <laughs> um. Okay, guys. So it seems like no suggestions. No. Links that I missed, no questions. So let's just wrap it up. Thank you guys very much for watching. As usual, you can find the VOD immediately after the stream on Twitch, or you can find it on the YouTube um, once I re-upload it there within a few hours. Yes, if you missed the stream or if you're watching this in the VOD and you still have questions, join our Discord server, ask the questions there. I am like 90% of the time there. We'll be more than happy to help you. And we have a very nice and cozy community. So you are more than welcome to join. So once again, thank you guys very much for watching. Thank you for your continued support. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Have an awesome uh, rest of the weekend or rest of the week. And I see you next time. Bye.